Fister. I work for NASA Ames Research Center. I'm interested in uh, water vapor and dynamics in the lower part of the ozone layer, the stratosphere. I have a meteorological background. Uh, I analyze aircraft data and the main motivation is looking at uh, water vapor in the upper part of the weather layer or the upper troposphere as it enters the stratosphere or what is better known as the ozone layer. And uh, the significance of that is uh, that, you know, though we have a pretty decent understanding of how water vapor varies as the climate changes in the troposphere, our understanding in the stratosphere is not as good and it does have an impact. I mean, there have been some studies that suggest it's maybe, you know, 10 to 20 percent of uh, global radiative forcing is related to water vapor changes in the stratosphere. Basically, radiative forcing is a uh, way that scientists describe how greenhouse gases and other things like aerosols, volcanic aerosols, affect the climate in a basic way. For example, you know, we know that carbon dioxide changes the radiative balance at the surface by effectively putting a blanket. So that has a certain quantitative radiative forcing on the whole Earth atmosphere system. And then there are a whole bunch of other things like aerosols. And so when I say water vapor in the stratosphere has a radiative forcing impact on um, the order of 10 or 20 percent based on some recent radiative studies, I'm comparing it to, you know, the whole gamut of, uh, of effects, aerosols, greenhouse gases, that are sort of driving this uh, climate change that we're seeing. Meteorological measurements of you know, have been fundamental for, gee, I can't know when they started making balloon soundings, but probably on the order of a hundred years ago. But, uh, you know, what we, what we now have is the ability to forecast weather and also to compare current weather to what we had before. So we have a long history of a variety of measurements the most fundamental of those are probably the surface stations that are all over the globe where we can actually, you know, derive a measurement of uh, surface temperature over the past hundred years. We've done this before, you know, with other things, tree rings, you know, glacial cores and things like that. But I'm going to start with the, you know, the man-made meteorological network. And then there are, of course, the, uh, there's a network of uh, radiosons uh, throughout the globe, mostly on land. Uh, you know, some places are more reliable than others. You know, in the United States, you've got uh, stations every 300 kilometers that make measurements uh, twice per day. Over the Pacific, you've got almost nothing. Uh, China and Russia and Europe are in good shape. The tropics are not in good shape. So that's another thing. These, these uh, balloon soundings, they go up to uh, 20 or 30 kilometers. They cover the relevant parts of the atmosphere to the problems that I'm talking about. Uh, you know, the stratosphere and, and the troposphere. And then there's the satellites, uh, which is the, the great thing that's happened now where we can get global coverage of uh, temperature and water vapor. Those are the fundamental things that, that drive, drive the weather and, and, and drive the climate. We don't actually have reliable global measurements uh, of, of carbon dioxide, a major greenhouse gas. We're starting to get that now with, with the OCO2 satellite, which was launched uh, about six months ago. Uh, and there was also, there, there's also a Japanese satellite that was launched earlier that, that is giving us those, those kinds of measurements. So that's a basic around of, of you know, the meteorological measurements that we have. You know, you can look at and, and think about it this way. If you want to get good horizontal resolution, you have to look down, okay? That's called nadir sounding. And what you see there is you see uh, radiation coming up at you at a variety of wavelengths. Uh, and depending on the wavelength you look at, you're looking at a different region of the atmosphere. And this gets into spectroscopy and edges of uh, spectral lines, uh, mostly from carbon dioxide, which is the most radiatively active gas in significant quantities. Uh, but the bottom line is if you look down, your vertical resolution is very limited. 
even using these sophisticated spectroscopic techniques. It's maybe about three or four or five kilometers even. And of course, there's a lot of much uh, finer resolution structures in the vertical, in the temperature structure that you need to resolve. So, uh, you know, that's the limitation of satellite uh, data that way. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do in terms of improving forecast models is instead of trying to derive the temperature profile and sticking that into the model to, you know, integrate and get a forecast, we actually just take the raw radiances and stick those into the model. Uh, so there have been some improvements in techniques about dealing with just this problem that you mentioned. Uh, the other way of looking at, uh, uh, you know, you can look down and get good horizontal resolution but poor vertical resolution. You can look to the side, to the limb, to the edge of the atmosphere, just kind of skimming down. Then you get good vertical resolution but then your horizontal resolution is 300 kilometers because you're looking at some sort of integral along the edge. Mm -hmm. So there are these compromises that you have to make. Okay. We have uh, focused mostly on, and in my specific research, mostly on, on the tropics. Um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of the, you know, the activity in the lowest part of the stratosphere, which we're observing by aircraft, and temperature changes are probably related to changes in convection rather than the radiative driving, which is more, it's going to be more of a factor, say, at higher latitudes. But yeah, that's, you know, that is a, a, a prediction, and I believe it has been to some extent borne out uh, by some of the data. I mean, one of the things uh, to keep in mind is that. Uh, you don't necessarily want to wait until these things become terribly obvious because certainly because of the length of time that CO2 stays in the atmosphere. By that time, it's arguably getting a little bit late because you could stop producing CO2 and you still have to wait, you know, many, many, many decades for that stuff to come down. I think that the way I would respond is point to the things that are already happening. Uh, and, you know, especially in the Arctic where models predict and where we know that uh, the warming and the changes are happening more rapidly. You know, we, we see, uh, you know, some sea level rise. Uh, we see the consistency between the basic evolution of the globally average temperature and what the models have predicted, including some of the past history, like, you know, some of the leveling off that we saw with the, uh, you know, increase in the aerosols as coal production was increasing in the mid part of the 20th century. I mean, all this is, you know, so look and see what's, what's happened, how the models have done, and look and see what's happening now. Uh, and to, to my mind, that, you know, you're never going to convince everybody. But to my mind, I think people are, you know, when you actually, when you look at polls, uh, I think most people are now convinced that climate change is real. I would argue that, uh, you know, we know the Earth is warming. We know we're causing it. Uh, and what I would say is perhaps the major impact that people need to worry about is, is sea level rise. That's going to have an immediate effect because so many people live near the coast. Uh, you know, what's, what's going to, and, and we already know that, you know, there's an, an uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet or a good chunk of it is, uh, is irreversibly melting. It's going to take a while, okay? This is not going to flood your house tomorrow or even flood your children's or grandchildren's house, but it's happening. Uh, so that, I think, is what, what I would point to, where I think we really know that this is the case. There have been, you know, issues of, well, we'll have more hurricanes. Well, that's not proven. I mean, there are a lot of uh, unsolved details that are important details. Uh, people have argued that there's going to be more severe weather. I think there's, that is certainly still a subject of scientific dispute. I think what is probably not in dispute is the rising sea level and also we'll, we'll probably get more incidences of severe rainfall, you know, that is, is, is fairly well established uh, at this stage. And, but I think that we will f probably be, you know, as we 
pursue this uh, uh, research on, on weather impacts, I think we'll, we will be able to find that, uh, that the likelihood of severe weather will increase in this warming climate. We're, we've got all this moisture in the atmosphere. Moisture represents a source of energy. And it, I would think that things would be get more energetic. But there's, there's details that have yet to be worked out. Heat waves are going to go up, if nothing else, uh, because we're increasing the average temperature. And there is clear evidence that we're actually increasing what I would say is the variance, that is, the deviation from that average temperature in both directions. I started out getting, being interested in science. Uh, I was going to study planets, but uh, then I got interested in a meteorology course uh, in my senior year in college. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the great synoptic meteorologists of the day uh, was teaching that course, and, and he was very encouraging. Uh, I enjoyed the class and, and got into, involved in atmospheric science. Uh, and, and it's probably worth pointing out that my father was a scientist too. So he studied uh, the ionosphere. So I've come down in the world, so to speak, uh, you know, at lower levels. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I got to NASA, they were doing work with aircraft uh, data. So I started analyzing aircraft data. And I combined that with, you know, what I knew about the stratosphere and my training in graduate school. And, that's pretty much where I am now. Uh, I think, you know, at, at NASA, you know, we, we pursue research that, you know, NASA is interested in. It's a little different than some of the other agencies where it's all investigator initiated. So to some extent, you're, 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 you're a little bit guided by, by your management, uh, which is okay. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a place for that in science. And there was a lot of interest in this subject, uh, and so I pursued it. I think it's the most important planet because it's the one we live at, live on. Uh, I think we should try to get to others, but that's a much longer term. We better watch our own climate because I think that if we don't watch it, it'll change faster than we can possibly move to another planet.